or including this paper in your session and welcome to the Royal Armies. Um, the museum here opened in 1996 on the Brownfield site. Uh, and you can see here an aerial view and a rather rough red outline, which is sort of roughly where the building is with the, um, yes, uh, with the tilt yard um, heading off at the top there. And then a ground level view of the dock basin before it was developed. So it was intended as an anchor institution in the regeneration of Leeds Dock of Richmore later and incorporated innovative display methods, including integrated performance spaces in the galleries and the purpose-built tilt yard, um, which runs along the bank of the river to the east of the main museum building, if you've had a chance to have a look around. The museum has not been subject to major investments since, and so we're now embarking on a long-term master plan, which will include the refurbishment of the building and its environs, and a representation of our collections. And for those that are um, just following on from Arcadis' papers, we're probably somewhere between stage zero and stage one, if you're wondering where we are in the Uber framework. So very early days, we're thinking about the strategic group. So this paper will introduce three aspects of the project. Firstly, the heritage of the institution. Secondly, that of the collection itself. And thirdly, the heritage of our surroundings from all of which we intend to draw out cultural value and significance to enrich the experience of coming here. So the origins of the institution itself, and indeed the collection, are to be found at the Tower of London, which housed the nation's arsenal from at least the 14th century to the mid-19th century, when the Office of Ordnance was dissolved and its main functions moved to more suitable and spacious accommodation elsewhere. In addition to manufacturing, storage and the distribution of weapons, there is also a very long history of their display at the tower, evidence of which starts from the 16th century. So here we can see a tour in full flow being given by a yeoman warder in the late 18th century, a site which you can still often see today. A significant part of the collection remains on view in the White Tower, most notably in the form of the refurbished Lion Kings, which includes the Tudor and Stuart armours, royal armours, and the 17th century wooden horses. And these horses are running free in the latest iteration of the Lion of Kings, as you can see. By the late 1980s, it was evident that the collection had outgrown the available accommodation at the tower, and the decision was made to move a large proportion of it out of London. A number of locations were considered, and eventually the site here at New Dock was selected. It ticked all the boxes bar one. There isn't a current or historical connection between the place and the subject matter of arms and armour. This lack of absolute connection was to some extent mitigated through the design of the new building, in which one can see the architect Derek Walker's wish to reflect its contents by adopting an austere and fortified external appearance. The design also referenced the historical display of weapons in the Hall of Steel, and by continuing the tradition of displaying armament outside. So moving on to the second theme, the collection is known for both its breadth and depth, with particular strengths from about 1400. It has an extensive Northern European core, but we also have holdings of material from around the world, including gifts such as the spectacular Japanese armour given to James I, material relating to hunting and weapons associated with civilian life. Since the museum opened in 96, new collections have come into the museum's care, such as the Pattern Room Collection, which consists of a comprehensive library charting the development of small arms up to the present day, together with increased holdings of artillery currently on display at Fort Nelson near Portsmouth. An interpretation strategy for the redisplay of the collection as a whole is underway, and this is informed by a new brand positioning, which embeds an audience-focused approach, one which will underpin a rethinking of the potential of the collection as a witness to historical events. There is much to be derived from taking a fresh look at the collection in this way, and we're optimistic that it can be represented to a much broader audience. 
So the third heritage strand is the one I want to propose to spend, I feel I propose to spend looking at in a bit more detail today, because so far it is underdeveloped and is very, it is very much master plan territory. And that is the future presentation of the museum's immediate environments. The site is actually bordered on two sides by listed structures and is in the immediate vicinity of several others, which together make up the Eastern Riverside Conservation Area. Some 200 metres to the north, there is a weir with medieval origins, first documented in 1636. It is located next to an island created by the tail race from Nether Mills on the north bank of the river. Abutting the museum's northeast side is a cut and block intended to allow vessels to pass the weir, and to the west of the museum is a later dock basin. These sites are all part of an expansive canal and river network known collectively as the air and cold navigation. This was an incredibly successful commercial network in operation from 1700 until the present day. The story goes something like this. By 1690, an estimated 2,000 tonnes of goods, mostly cloth from the west driving towns of Leeds, Halifax and Wakefield, were being sent to Hull by road. Cloth was brought into Leeds from the surrounding valleys by pack horse, finished and marketed in the town, then transshipped to a more efficient carrier system of wagons, which took the cloth to the inland ports of Tadcaster, York, Selby and Nottingham, where it was transshipped again to sloops and keels bound for Hull and on to London and overseas. The technology to pass leads down was already known. The pound block used in the 1560s on the Exeter Canal had made it possible for craft to bypass weirs. So in theory, it would be possible to make the air and cold and navigable as far inland as Leeds and Wakefield. The scheme had a couple of false starts in the early 1600s, largely because of opposition from the corporation of the city of York which controlled the lower section of the river air. But it gained momentum again in the 1680s and 1690s, enough to overcome that opposition. The initiators of the scheme were some of the leading men of the Corporation of Leeds, mostly wealthy woolen merchants and local landowners who were interested in extending the market for the coal being mined on their estates. They commissioned the engineer, Mr John Hadley, from West Bromwich to design and cost the navigation, which he did, recommending seven new locks and the deepening of the channel in some sections at a cost of £5,200. The scheme was funded by subscription. William Milner, Mayor of Leeds, in 1697, subscribed £1,000 towards it, for example. So the Aaron Calder navigation, which we can... Which is, um, where's my bit? Well, it's much more ex extensive than this, actually, but it just shows the two main routes from Leeds uh, through to Selby, Goole, and Wakefield through to Goole, and then off in boats to Hull. So the navigation was given royal assent on the 4th of May, 1699, and by November 1700, the first small boats carrying cargoes um, of up to 15 tonnes were able to make their way inland to the centre of Leeds. The last lock and cut on their journey was at the lock outside this museum, before reaching Leeds Bridge, which marked the limit of the navigation. Warehouses began to populate the banks on either side of the river. The trade from the 1790s to the middle of the 19th century was predominantly in woolen cloth. At the beginning of this period, the navigation could accommodate vessels of 60 tonnes capacity, but by the time the Leeds and Liverpool Canal opened in 1816, bringing in more traffic from the west, the annual dividends were in excess of 54,000, and vessels of 100 tonne capacity were able to reach both Wakefield and Leeds. So this is just a little... Um, the, the Leeds section, we're where that red dot is, next to New Dock. Um, Crown Point Bridge is a late 19th century bridge. Um, the Leeds Bridge has been there for a very long time, but the one that you can see today is also late 19th century. One Dock Street is the offices of the Navigation, built in 1906, with 
hear about that in a minute. Just want to point on this map because we don't come back to it later. But that is Stoughton, where uh, which will be mentioned later. Uh, and the Leeds and Liverpool Canal that is just coming in here. So when that opened in 1816, we've got the full uh, the Trans Pennine route. Sorry, um, is is complete. Uh, so this is the uh, the Aaron Calder Navigation Buildings on what became known as Warehouse Hill. That's it shown in 1799, and you can see um, a great gathering of boats of one kind or another. And later on, uh, that's Warehouse Hill. I think probably it's undated this thing, photograph, but maybe at the turn of the century. So from the 1850s, the main cargo into Leeds was. Um, coal. By 1877, there were 102 collieries in the Leeds area, producing a combined two and a half million tons of coal, supplying the insatiable boilers and steam-driven machines in the Leeds factories. At about this time, New Dock was built, providing additional space for barges, usually carrying coal. Although the dock was also known as Potato Dock, the basin was later extended to the west and the south. So that's it. Uh, there with um, bar its barges full of coal and a much lower, as you can see, where the, the, all the buildings are much higher now. And then this was also a familiar site on the navigation. These are, um, were known as Tom Puddings and they carried coal in as many as you felt you could pull, I think. <laughs> Um, so in the 1890s, the navigation enjoyed another period of prosperity, reaping about 60,000 a year, and as late as 1906, the navigation opened smart new offices at One Dock Street. You may have walked past these um, over the Lid Bridge if you, if you walk from the station to here. On the 1st of January 1948, the navigation became part of the British Transport Commission under the Docks and Inland Waterways. And by the 60s, all the locks except Leeds Lock and the flood locks at Castleford, Nostrop and Broadreach had been electrified. And by the 1970s, the canal was catering for vessel, a vessel sorry, carrying up to 700 tonnes. The successor to the British Waterways Board is, of course, the Canal and River Trust, which, although closely associated with the recreational use of the waterways, is also interested in the potential of the canals to which... Um, to once again reduce the pressure on the road network. And in this respect, our story, our story does not stop there. The area called the navigation is still a commercial waterway, designated in Schedule 12, Part 1 of the Transport Act, 1968. A planning application is currently under consideration by Leeds City Council to create two new wharfs on the river air at Stourton, a few miles down river from here. This new inland port would be capable of handling up to 200,000 tonnes a year of bulk cargoes such as aggregate steel and timber. River vessels would once again follow the route from Gould to Nostrup Wharf in Leeds and to the Wakefield Europort as a freight priority route. The first phase of development is intended to provide for the transportation of materials for the construction industry in Leeds, but in the future the CRT and its partners are exploring the feasibility for movement of shipping containers. So the story of the Aaron Calder navigation is told, albeit in an ad hoc way, in the immediate vicinity of the museum and at some points along the waterfront. An interpretation scheme was installed in 2008 along with a new footbridge, the Knight's Way, and landscaping along the edge of the dock basin, which acknowledges the location of the cranes. However, from a design perspective, could something more be made of the juxtaposition between the dock and canal edge and the museum's building setting? So this is just an example of the um, original modern paving adjacent to the dock. And um, you can see, well, you can't see very well, actually, but there is actually that the stone on the right is inscribed and it says 1.5 tonne crane. So there is, uh, there is interpretation in, in this area. It's quite subtle, though, and you have to look for it. Um, the 
I think that uh, I just wanted to sort of point out this. When I'm talking about the juxtaposition here, I'm just talking about, you see, this is the edge of the museum building here. Um, and it actually goes all the way, this sort of very dark grey stone goes all the way around the building. Um, so the, the point is, could we be thinking about this in a slightly different way? Um, where have I got to? Yes. So, um, Sir George Head, touring the manufacturing districts of England in the summer of 1835, described the approach to Leeds from Castleford along the navigation as worthy of a large metropolis. The long vistas of water, wide and straight, bounded by graceful elliptical bridges in the distance, the lock houses, ornamental buildings, the solid masonry at the sides, whether by slanting planes of paving stone or low perpendicular walls, all together form a perfect specimen of modern art and excellent taste. I'm not sure this stretch of the navigation could be described in this way. We have yet to successfully meld the original materials with those of the 1996 setting and to evoke the tremendous energy and activity along this stretch of the river and within the dock itself. A new footbridge, um, not yet over, so that, yes, you can see that's the Knight's Way footbridge there, the white one which rather crowds out the scene, I have to say. And then this is um, some of the original stonework here. And once you get your eye in, these, these blocks are really, they are very pleasing. Um, right, that's my stuff again. Oh yes, the new footbridge, not yet open, which will connect the situ development on the north bank to the south bank, adopts a contemporary aesthetic which seems more in keeping with the historic setting in terms of its proportions and materials and aligns more comfortably with earlier bridges along the network. So there's the new bridge, which um, is using this kind of, th this rusty red finish, which of course is also very ingenious in respect of uh, vandalism and um, particularly graffiti, as in it would be very unrewarding to try and, to try and um, use it for graffiti. So it's, it's, um, it looks good, but it's also clever. Um, this is a, a newly bridge near Horsforth. This is beyond the navigation as you come out the other side of Leeds, but it may be the sort of thing that um, uh, Sir George Head was describing, this, this kind of bridge, this kind of aesthetic, if you like, it's a cast iron bridge. So, our challenge is, we are right at the heart of this amazing story and one that is so integral to the success of this merchant city in the past and potentially into the future. How can we build it into our master plan and make the most of this most fortuitous location? If the first project here was all about moving out of London and arriving here, our project today is about sustainability, it's about consolidation, refinement, and relationships with our immediate surroundings and with the city in which we are located. Our building today looks away from the river and the dock rather than embracing it and its history. And although the architect's original line of thinking is understood, are there other ways in which we can save royal armories other than through our fortified appearance? Today, we expect our public buildings to be more porous and welcoming. Interestingly, a painting commissioned at the time of our moving here um, gives more of a feeling of what the public realm could look like. And you might note the greenery, the dense forest on either side of the building, which sadly didn't come to fruition. And, and of course, the historic boats um, in the basin and uh, in the navigation itself. It is worth adding that we're not the only ones master planning along this stretch of the river. The South Bank Regeneration Framework makes provision for the arrival of HS2 in 2033, and before that, the redevelopment of the Tetley complex to the west of us, which will include a city park. With planning in the air, there are opportunities for partnerships which may lead to a more coherent route from the city to the museum, perhaps taking in the other elements of this industrial landscape. And in due course, we may establish new connections with companies still manufacturing today. One final point, beyond the ways in which we can connect people to the physical remains of the past, we're very conscious that place is not just about infrastructure, content and facilities, but how it feels 
Most notably in this instance, is it attractive? Is it, does it feel welcoming and interesting? In addition, in addition to considering the landscaping and design of the exterior of the building, we're developing a number of initiatives to make stronger connections with both our local community and other communities in the city, which by the way is the most diverse outside London. Of long-term benefits, as well as transforming the interior of our building and the display and interpretation of our collection, our location, far from being either neutral or a problem, could well help us to make those connections by reviving and respecting the story of the air and call the navigation. Thanks.